So, uh, real pleasure to now introduce uh, Scott Midson from the University of Manchester, Religions and Theology postdoc. And the subject is Love and Liberation from Creation to the Singularity. Scott. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to this talk today. Uh, and thank you uh, also for the invite to the conference. It's been a really, really uh, interesting uh, sort of session, of, uh, series of talks. Um, before I go into my talk, which is on love and liberation from creation to the singularity, I just want to sort of give you a bit of context of the project that I'm working on at the moment, uh, where this uh, paper falls into. So my uh, research project is with the Lincoln Theological Institute, and I'm working on a postdoc called uh, Living With and Loving Machines. Uh, and this kind of came about on the back of my PhD research, where I looked at cyborgs and theological anthropology. Uh, and I concluded uh, that we need to look at our relationships with technologies and not go to uh, drift towards kind of substantive interpretations that there is a fundamental difference between humans and machines. Uh, so on the back of that, it, it was kind of, sort of saying, well, there's no, if there's no fundamental difference, what is the kind of shape of our relationships with machines? Um, and so this project kind of came out of that, um, engaging with people like Sherry Turkle, who says technology is to change the nature of our human concepts, things like love. Uh, love is also kind of a key concept in Christian theology as well. So what's kind of going on there? What can we maybe expect? I haven't really written that much on the singularity or the kind of the apocalyptic point of technologies before, so this was a useful opportunity to kind of ex explore the kind of direction that these technologies are going in. Okay. Um, I also should apologise, I made some of these slides after a little bit too tipsy on wine last night, so if you do get bored or confused in <laughs> my talk, you can just spot the slides that are wine-influenced. Okay. Visions of the singularity anticipate a future where we will be able to interact and engage with machines on a deeper level than at present. Some, like Rodney Brooks, see it as bringing about the total cyborgization of humans, such that the boundary between humans and machines is completely erased. This is facilitated by interim advancements that suggest a deepening familiarity between humans and machines, and some, such as David Levi, hold the view that artificial intelligence will eventually reach a point where we can even fall in love with our technological creations. In both of these scenarios, which tell of our bond with machines that could be perhaps considered as loving, given that fusions too are considered as a form of love, what is it that we seek or desire? In order to respond to this question effectively, we need to reflect both on technologies and love. In this paper, I ask what kind of love is envisioned in the singularity, as this question can uh, aid reflections on how we understand the role and place of humans in the world, vis-a-vis -vis not only technologies in the future, but also in relation to animals, nature, and the wider cosmos, as well as to God uh, as part of a broader metaphysical schema that, I argue, allows us to rethink the difference between the religious and the secular in theologically interesting ways. So in science, as Max Moore and Natasha Vitamore write, singularity refers to a discontinuity or a mathematical point where an object is not defined or to a cosmological event where a measure of the gravitational field becomes infinite. When applied to reflections on and anticipations of technology, singularity is used to describe a conjecture about the emergence of superintelligent minds. Combining these two interpretations, the suggestion of infinitude and the lack of definition that this entails from the scientific understanding can be said to be technologically realised in the latter technological understanding. This is because the imagining of minds that surpass our own levels, and levels of intelligence implies a transcendence of the present human condition, looking ahead either to our own enhanced future or that of another species at present unknown and alien to us. French Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote about a future involving superintelligences. For Teilhard, life being an ascent of consciousness could not continue to advance indefinitely along its line without transforming itself in depth. Consciousness is representative of the evolution of life from its rudimentary forms through to becoming reflexively self-aware, to its manifestation in humans, and to its subsequent and post-human forms. Significantly then, for Teilhard, Humans are not the telos of evolution, and it's here where his ideas most strongly accord with the notion of the singularity in its technological and futurist forms. The singularity anticipates the next evolutionary stages of life by attending to the awakening of machines, such that they can attain a consciousness, uh, however it's understood uh, for Tehar, this is about increasing levels of complexity. Here the technological has, in a sense, become conscious and a post-human future is suggested. 
While there are notable parallels between Teha's evolutionary vision and the technological singularity, the identification of which can help us to understand more about what we desire in the future and for the technologies that are presently been de being developed to pave the path to it, there are also dissimilarities between the two visions. These can help us to be critically aware of our desires, and in this essay I consider these through the notion of love. In the preface to Teilhard's magnum opus, The Phenomenon of Man, Julian Huxley uh, indicates how love features in Teilhard's work. He writes, Per Teilhard enables us to see which possibilities are in the long run desirable. What is more, he has helped us to, to, to define the long conditions of advance, the conditions which will permit an increase of fulfilment and prevent an increase of frustration. The conditions of advance are these, global unity of mankind's noetic organisation or system of awareness, but a high degree of variety within that unity, and love with goodwill and full cooperation, personal, personal integration and internal harmony, and increasing knowledge. Love, then, provides the foundations for Teha's evolutionary schema. This is, understood in, uh, sorry, second. this is understood in terms of unity and harmony, and so there is a strong emphasis given to the ways that love is about togetherness. Is this kind of love found in visions of the technological singularity? Is it important or even necessary? Before answering either of these questions, more exploration of Teilhard's understanding of love is needed. How does it relate to evolution? Evolution for Teilhard is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines must follow. It is central to his theory, and while it clearly uh, draws from scientific principles advocated by Darwin, unlike Darwin's description of natural selection where random mutations may give, may give an edge for competitive survival, it is also a more complex process with a sense of direction. This directionality highlights values in the evolutionary system, and it is love that directs us to seeking those values. As Teilhard goes on to say, it is only when driven by the forces of love that the fragments of the world seek each other so that the world may, uh, may come to being. Love is therefore vital to Teilhard's system. This is especially so, according to Huxley's summary of Teilhard's cosmology, uh, given that we, mankind, contain the possibilities of the Earth's immense future and can realise more and more of them on condition that we increase our knowledge and our love. For Teha, then, humans must steer evolution towards the future, which involves the introduction of superlife. So love for Teha is a means of sustaining the momentum and the pursuit of progress, and religion is an important uh, part of this cosmology. Writing of his use of science, for example, Teha notes that neither in its impetus nor its achievements can science go to its limits without being tinged with, with mysticism and charged with faith. It is faith and love for Teha that maintains scientific progress. To that end, Teha can comments that in one essay that religion's true purpose is to sustain and spur on the progress of life. It is the profound need of an absolute sought from the start through every progressive form of religion. So here religion provides the narratival framework that imbues our actions with meaning and sustains us on the path to ushering, it, uh, to ushering in super life. The mediation and manifestation of that process in the sense of progress for Teha is realised as love. In bringing so together science and religion then, Teha calls attention to the values that are part of his scientific observations, whilst also finding an evidential basis for some of his more abstract claims and ideas, such as that of love, thereby giving it a stronger grounding. Thus, Teilhard identifies that love is the most universal, formidable and myst um, mysterious of cosmic energies. As demonstrated here, Teha articulates love as a spiritual force, but insofar as it is also an energy and it has tangible effects, it also functions in a scientific or quasi-scientific way. So it's this energy and not just a kind of mystical idea. Love for Teha is that which guides and maintains evolution by helping humans to actively steer evolution in an appropriate and a favourable direction. And to that extent, it features prominently in his philosophical treatise on the universe. Similarly, in the technological singularity, it is humans that are seen as responsible for bringing in the next evolutionary stage for better and or for worse. Julian Huxley, who we've already heard about today, whose contention that man is nothing else than evolution become conscious of itself, influenced and was cited by Teilhard. And he also developed the notion of transhumanism to refer to the ongoing development of humanity. 
Huxley envisaged and advocated the idea of man remaining man, but transcending himself by realising new possibilities of and for his human nature. And we've already heard that quote today, but I think it's important and bears repeating. This finds resonance with Tehar's asser assertion that life had, like all growing realities in the world, to become different so as to remain itself. So there's this interesting kind of tension and uh, kind of continuity of the human idea there, the idea of human nature as expansive and also kind of crossing a gate of difference. Huxley's position on human enhancement is also represented by Humanity Plus, which is an influential transhumanist group. In its mission statement, this group declares that it broadly advocates the ethical use of technology to expand human capacities, which involves wanting people to be better than well. For many transhumanists, the singularity represents the realisation of these lofty aims that can enable the fulfilment of our human capacities. Exemplifying this, Ray Kurzweil sees that the singularity will represent the culmination of the merger of our biological thinking and existence with our technology resulting in a world that is still human, but that transcends our biological roots. For some transhumanists, the extent of these changes will render us ultimately post-human, which suggests a stronger detachment from the human and a crossing of what Elaine Graham terms the gates of difference. All of these figures, though, the human, the transhuman and the post-human, have a stake in the technological singularity, which complicates an understanding and analysis of it. Who is the technological singularity about, or who is it for the benefit for? Applying the concept of love, which is the key methodological framework of this paper to the question, affirms and highlights the role of the human in visions of the singularity. Seeking a better future is suggestive of a love for those that one wants to better. In other words, if you pursue a better future for your children, that could take, be taken as exemplifying a love you have for your children. If you pursue a better future for humanity, that could likewise be taken as a love for humanity. Or, in no surprising way, pursuing a better future for the world could signify a love for the world. The development of technologies that culminate in the technological singularity in accordance with transhumanist values underscored by Humanity Plus suggests a love of the human. For Michael Hauskeller, however, the human that is loved is only the idealised future human that is always already transhuman or posthuman, and this entails a denigration or critique of the present state of humanness. The drive to usher in a new age, in other words, voices a discontent with the present state of things. We literally embody these limits in our vulnerable, ageing skin sacks, as transhumanists might refer to it. And it is these that are most notably critiqued among transhumanists rather than the totality of humanness. So there's a kind of split in how we think about the human that's going on. There are, to be sure, uh, continuities from human to transhuman and posthuman that also do su suggest a celebration of our nature. So it's this kind of interesting nuance of critique that's going on, this, this tension of how we understand the human. As a consequence of this position, human nature becomes divorced from concrete and embodied experience, and aspects of our of finer, sorry, and aspects of or finitude and mortality, and in short, our vulnerability, become critiqued and read as part of the human condition. As Hauskeller writes, from a transhumanist perspective, any necessity is bad because, by definition, it curbs our freedom. Necessities prevent us from being self-sufficient and truly autonomous. This raises the question, can love be figured without a sense of limits? Can it be genuine when it's disconnected from the mortal body? For house colour, the answer is no. Loving someone always holds a risk. It makes us open to certain kinds of suffering. Thus, the transhumanist pursuit of being better than well seems to advocate what Hauskeller considers to be a godlike and loveless detachment in the striving for complete autonomy. And he writes, If love is a human disease, a condition that is yet another source of potentially great suffering and one that makes us, to some degree, dependent on the object of our love, then we cannot be truly autonomous as long as we have not got rid of love. Gods, then, do not love. They are self-sufficient and do not need anyone else. End quote. This reveals a theologically inspired liberationist drive at the heart of the technological singularity for transhumans and posthumans. Love for the transhuman and posthuman is a love for the abstract and utopian vision of the perfected human according to its nature and liberated from its mortal constraints. Does Teilhard advocate love for the human or the future human in a similar way? 
And this is a difficult point, I argue, to determine. On the one hand, for Tehar, mankind, the spirit of the earth, the synthesis of individuals and peoples, are called utopian, and yet they are biologically necessary. And for them to be incarnated in the world, all we may well need is to imagine our power of loving developing until it embraces the total of men and the earth. Love is thus deeply connected to the human, for Tehar, and the realisation of cosmological and evolutionary goals through the axial figure. On the other hand, that Tehar recognises the importance of the human in his meta-narrative does not mean that his final goal is that of the human, to reiterate the human is not the telos of his kind of evolutionary schema. Instead, for Tehar, man is not the centre of the universe as once we thought in our simplicity, but something much more wonderful, the arrow pointing the way to the final unification of the world in terms of life. Man alone constitutes the last born, the freshest, the most complicated, the most subtle of all the successive layers of life. This, we realise, is somewhat different from transhumanist approaches to the technological singularity, whereby the liberation of human nature is the apparent goal, which is what the transhuman and or posthuman seems to signify. Instead, for Teha, life has already been liberated, or indeed has liberated itself, from the tendency for matter to succumb to the principles of entropy, as that is to give way to disorder and to equilibrium, as he writes in one of his essays. So espousing a radical vitalism, Tehar contends that life exists as a countercurrent against the ordinary laws of physics. It seeks its own evolutionary ends through, towards increasing levels of complexity. So where this suggests, uh, where this is perhaps a more, uh, most acutely demonstrated is in the different approaches to materiality and suffering held by Tehar and transhumanists. For the latter, for transhumanists, the human condition is a set of constraints to be overcome in a kind of rejection of Malthusian principles about, uh, that describe limits uh, towards, goal, towards growth. So Malthus talks about limits on uh, kind of population growth, and he says that there will always be a kind of natural equilibrium when population growth it gets to a certain point that exceeds the capacities of the Earth to sustain it. That's where there will be kind of checks and balances that reduce the population, and an equilibrium is kind of upheld. So transhumanism, in a sense, is a kind of pushing back against these limits and these conditions towards more expansion. So while that's going on on one hand, yet for Tehar, a more ecologically sensitive position is advocated that speaks to what the theologians regard as creation rather than nature. Put differently, if nature is seen as something lifeless in its scientific readings from Newtonian mechan mechanics onwards, and thereby something that, be, that can be controlled and partially overcome from Baconian idealism onwards, then creation is a theological response and an attempt to recapture the vitality of the created world. So this is kind of taken from what uh, Norman Vietzfer talks about in his book From Nature to Creation. He's kind of trying to draw a theological distinction between the kind of dull and lifeless mechanised vision of nature against the kind of enchanted uh, and divinely kind of still, um, yeah, still kind of enchanted vision of creation and is still kind of lively in that sense. So indeed, Tehar is cited by Pope Francis in his recent encyclical Laudato Si, where in a section on the mystery of the universe, the document describes how, quote, the ultimate destiny of the universe is the fullness of God, which has already been attained by the risen Christ, the measure of the maturity of all things. Here we can add yet another argument for rejecting every tyrannical and irresponsible domination of human beings over other creatures, which are moving forward with us and through us towards a common point of arrival, which is God, in that transcendent fullness where the risen Christ embraces and illumines all things." End quote. So although Tehard isn't directly referred to in that passage there, there is a footnote that is given in the sort of encyclical that directs us to Tehard's kind of cosmology and this kind of direction of life towards God. To be sure, the human is nonetheless important here as well as in Tehard's schema, but this is in a different way to transhumanist visions of the technological singularity. A key difference is how love is figured and expressed in both. Tehar res refers to specifically Christian love throughout his work, which he notes as incomprehensible to those who have not experienced it. That the infinite and the intangible can be lovable, or that the human heart can beat with genuine, genuine charity for a fellow being, seems impossible to many people I know, in fact, almost monstrous. Tehard is referring here to an, un uh, to an, uh, sorry, to an unmotivated love, 
that contains no immediate personal gain. And it seems difficult to discern this in transhumanism and transhumanist approaches to the singularity, where love is filtered and read through the ideal human or humanist subject. In other words, transhumanist love seems to be an outworking of the human, whereas Teilhard's Christian love is suggested as something external to the human, something at once creaturely and divine that humans are encouraged to participate in. To elaborate on how Christian love underpins Teilhard's cosmology, consider what Ursula King comments of it. She writes, It belongs to the heart of Christian belief that transcendent love is the creator and sustainer of the world, and that love pulsates through all of life as ceaseless energy of the divine spirit operating in nature and humanity. Love is mystical, divine, and it extends beyond the human here. As such, it is through love that Teilhard appears, appeals to the human, but this is firmly in the framework of a wider metaphysical cosmology. And love, it seems, is that cosmology. Not only is love then the means in Teilhard's framework, but is also uh, the ends of it. So it's kind of both means and ends. It's kind of the way we're going to get to this kind of Talos point, and it is also the Talos point. And it is, again, Teilhard's uh, theological references that convey this. For him, the figure of Christ... Uh, not only described in a book, but as realised in the concrete and Christian consciousness, is so far the most perfect approximation to a final and total object towards which the, human, the universal human effort can tend without being uh, or becoming wearied or deformed. Here, Christ is a symbol for the culmination of evolutionary efforts. And to that end, the description of Christ here is correlative with what Teilhard describes as the omega point. This is the point inspired by the Christological notion of Perugia, where the universe attains eschatological divine unification and, as Huxley summarises of Teilhard's ideas, where the new sphere will be intensely unified and will have achieved a hyper-personal organisation. Teilhard sees the newest figure as a stage in the evolution of life towards its increasing complexity and self-representation, which requires faith and hope to give meaning and soul to the immense organism that we are building, in his words. So all of this for Teilhard is saturated with God. Indeed, God has he has described the new sphere, which is a layer of thought, action and love arising out of the biosphere as the theosphere. The omega point thus marks the, prog the progression of life towards divine ends via divine... Duh, duh, duh. The, progression, the omega point thus marks the progression of life towards divine ends and via divine means, both of which are for Teilhard, love. Teilhard's ultimate vision then is a mystical theological one of unification. Transhumanist anticipations of the technological singularity too seek, uni seek unification with the machine in the awakening of the computational. What each seeks or recognises of the positioning of humans in the universe, however, highlights subtle differences between the two. An analysis using love as its guiding concept has begun to expose this. And I want to stress that this is just a starting point of a wider conversation that I, I want to build. And I, I realised when I was writing this that it kind of sounds like I'm siding with Teha's kind of utopian uh, vision of unification. I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to sort of, I will expand on the kind of critique of that in the broader version of this paper. Uh, which sounds like a cop-out, but honestly, it's, it's yeah. Um, so, the religious uh, foundations and connotations of transhumanist ideas are increasingly well-documented, and Teilhard can be used to further call attention to these, but tensions nonetheless remain. God, for transhumanists, seems to be a product of their own creation, be that transhuman or posthuman, whereas for Teilhard, God is love, and this spurs on the process of evolution. Humans are important in bringing about evolutionary change for both groups that have been considered briefly here, but the underpinning motives, drives and desires, in short, what is loved, differ. In the context of the singularity and the omega, of the omega point, what is it that we seek? Perfection? Unity? Harmony? Connection? And how do these desires impact our everyday, rela with rela everyday relationships with machines en route to that technological singularity? And while this paper has not necessarily offered definitive answers, I hope to have at least suggested a way of approaching an important conversation of big stories and small gadgets by reflecting on the value of big minds and perhaps bigger hearts. And on that point, I will end. Um, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Anyone have a question for Scott?
No? Michael, you haven't spoken for a while. I'll start with you and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Scott. I've, I've encountered Chardin, but only sort of secondarily through others. So uh, you mentioned his Christology and its connections to cosmology. I'm wondering if at this point you could speak a bit more on his Christology and how that relates. You, I mean, you did mention that he thought Christ was a symbol of the best possible, if, if I heard you correctly, the sort of best possible human until we reach the new sphere or sort of omega point. Yeah. Is, is that correct? Or maybe speak further on his Christology. I'm just interested in, in that point. So the way I kind of I read it, I read it when I was kind of uh, going through uh, the primary material on Tehar. I still need to do a bit more supplementary reading on this. Uh, the way I kind of read it was that he sees he he places his kind of mysticism, this kind of divine abstract idea of love or love as energy, as the kind of paramount thing. And I think Christ is a sort of part of that. So the way I kind of read it was not as a sort of um, he doesn't really have an incarnational perspective on Christology. It seems to be to be more of this kind of abstract notion of love that he kind of grounds through a scientific approach to energy rather than grounding it in the human particularly. So it's kind of an interesting eschatology. Um, and this is why I wanted to kind of expand on, so this is why I kind of mentioned uh, Laudato Si in relation to Chardon's work because um, I think there's an e interesting kind of ecological commentary that's going on there in a kind of Maltmanian way with the kind of idea of the Imago Christi and the kind of vision of, of Christ. But I think Teilhard's taking it in a very non sort of incarnational way. This is just kind of early notes and ideas that I've had from reading it. And as I say, I need to supplement it a little bit more. But I think for me, it's his mysticism that comes through kind of more. And it's this kind of the mystery of Christ, I guess. Mustafa. Um, so I, I, I was struck by uh, the fact that uh, Taya de Chardin is engaged with uh, by people like uh, David Noble in the religion of technology and a year after that uh, by Eric Davis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in uh, I think Technosis. it's called Technosis yeah, yeah. Um, and he draws um, interesting connections between the noosphere and the rise of the internet and the web, et cetera, et cetera. And then we could link that to artificial general intelligence and the work of people like Ben Gert Gertzel and others. Um, but, and, and I don't know anything about what I'm going to ask you about, so I, I, I'm interested just in your thoughts on this. Um, when you mentioned this Laudato Si, I, I was struck by the wording of your slide, which said challenges irresponsible uh -huh, yeah. dominion. So what constitutes the, the grounds or criteria for responsibility? I mean, when, it, when is domination? It's not dominion, actually. It's, it's domination. domination on that, yeah. yeah. Uh, when is domination good and when is domination not so good? Uh, so this is, if I can just sort of touch on your point about the internet at first, and there are uh, people that have come, sort of said that Tehar was the original kind of prophet of the internet, the way he's kind of talked about the new sphere, and it's Eric uh, Steinhardt, and his, uh, he's got a short article that links it to transhumanism, and he's kind of gone through uh, some of this. I didn't want to go into the Eric Davis stuff in this paper because I'm kind of saving that for another paper I'm writing on the internet and how we kind of interact with it as a kind of new sphere type thing. So this is a sort of the offcuts of a different kind of paper and everything. But uh, so your point about uh, your question about Laudato C. Um, yeah, it's an interesting document because it is the first time uh, that a paper encyclical has sort of given a reference to ecology in the sort of strong sense that it has by uh, Pope Francis. Uh, he talks a lot about climate change. He talks a lot about our responsibility to the environment. He talks about, um, I can't think of the phrase that he uses for it. It's a, it's a, it's a universalism, but it's like a kind of ecumenical universalism where everything's kind of coming together at the same kind of time. It's a sort of it touches on Teilhard's unification but in a very ecological sense rather than a kind of distant eschatological sense and I think as part of that what he's trying to do is recognize that in Laudato Si he's trying to recognize that humans have technology but we also have responsibility through that technology um, there's a wider conversation in the background of this about uh, the dominion of Genesis 126 127 uh, the kind of stewardship that humans have uh, there's a wider conversation about that as a sort of sense that we read human nature in Imago Dei, humans in the image of God, uh, but that kind of becomes a sort of a, a legitimation of reckless kind of godlike behaviour where we kind of play God on, on the earth and that's kind of where we subdue and uh, it's what kind of Terry Eagleton calls a bovine anthropocentrism where we're sucking from the earth. 
what I think is going on here is uh, this kind of critique of that with the irresponsible, with the, with the uh, uh, with warning against uh, what he says is a tyrannical and irresponsible domination of human beings over other creatures. It's recognizing what theologians have called a common creatureliness, and it's kind of more of a horizontal kind of um, ecological e eco theology rather than a vertical one that emphasizes that Imago Day. So it's looking at the ways that other creatures too. Um, a part of you know kind of creation, part of the the way that God created the world, and it's not just kind of humans on a pedestal above everything else, but it's the kind of connections across them. Uh, so it's, it's it's pushing against that, and I can talk more about the anthropology behind it and stuff at, um, afterwards. But uh, it's it's gesturing towards that. Did that answer okay. the question? Sorry, is that okay? Anybody else? No. Scott, thank you thank very you. much.